All right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our Grays Prairie Missionary Baptist Church Wednesday night Bible study. And tonight, we're going to be continuing in the book of Titus, chapter 2. Glad you guys are all here joining us, and um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And lots of things to be praying about this week, um, lots of things to be thinking about. Um, if you have any prayer requests, you can always throw those in on the comments to this video. And we will definitely be glad to be praying about those things with you. Um, don't forget, of course, that we're having church this Sunday. Uh, Drive-in church, weather permitting, of course. And we'll also still be broadcasting on Facebook Live for any of you who um, want to catch us there. And let's go ahead and get started. And I, I wanted to kick off today by asking you guys to think about something very specific. What is, in your opinion the difference between preaching in the church and teaching in the church. What's the difference between those two things? What's the difference between preaching and teaching? And something to kind of think about is who do you think benefits from preaching and who do you think benefits from teaching? Um, a funny thing, <clears throat> we all think of Sunday school as just being such a normal part of church, but it actually started off um, in the 1800s to help teach young children um, during the Industrial Revolution how to read um, and to teach them basic Bible stories. Um, it, it grew out of a burden uh, that someone had on their heart and it just became this big thing that actually instructed kids how to read as well as in the Bible. And now we have kind of turned Sunday school into the church's primary teaching um, effort. It all takes place during Sunday school. That's where we do most of our teaching. We buy curriculums. We spend money on um, different things so that we can teach kids and teach our church members. Um, and of course, you know, we all know people that just will not come to Sunday school no matter what. Um, and they're, unfortunately, when that happens, a lot of them miss out on a big part of what the church has to offer when they don't come to Sunday school, because it is a big part of what the church is about. And today we're going to be talking about um, a little bit more in detail about that teaching aspect. We kicked it off last week and we talked about, well, a couple weeks ago, um, we kicked it off a couple weeks ago and talked about what should be being taught to older men, older women, and younger women. And now we're going to keep going through the end of chapter 2 here. So we're going to be in Titus chapter 2, verses um, 6 through 15. And if you guys want to go ahead and flip there with me, we're going to take a look at this. If you guys remember, um, Titus, of course, was sent to the island of Crete. Huge mess. But Paul needed him there to kind of straighten some things out and take care of things. And as Titus went to Crete, Paul sent him this letter to give him instructions, advice, and generally just be some help to the poor young guy who's going to be um, taking over as kind of an elder role in the churches and trying to straighten out all the other elders and all the other pastors in these little house churches. Um, it's a case where um, the culture took over the church and not vice versa. And so you have a lot of corruption within the church and a lot of things that are happening. So let's take a look at um, let's take a look at Titus chapter two. We're going to start in verse six, and it says this. It says, "Likewise, urge young men to be sensible in all things. Well, likewise, urge the young man to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be an example of good deeds, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame." having nothing bad to say about us. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, um, but showing off good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men and instructing us um, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope that and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority and let no one disregard you. So here we have um, a continuation of the thought that started in chapter 2. So Paul is he's talking about, he's telling Titus to teach in chapter 2. 
telling Titus to teach, and he says, um, teach older men. We read about that. Teach older women. And then he says something really interesting. He tells older women that they are supposed to teach younger women, um, that the younger women need to love their husbands, love their children, to be sensible, pure workers um, at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And going into verse 6, he says, likewise. Likewise, it's comparing uh, what men, young men, are supposed to be. And he only gives, like, he's continuing this phrase of, this idea of teaching, but he, he only gives really one thing for young men. And he says, likewise, urge young men to be sensible. Likewise, urge young men to be sensible. And he just kind of stops there. And if you know very many young men, you know sometimes young men are not sensible. And once upon a time, I was a young man. And let me tell you, I was the furthest thing from sensible. And I I, it pains me to think of all the stupid things that I did when I was a young man, but um, young men are just not sensible. They have so much passion and so much drive and so much desire to do things and make a name for themselves. A lot of times they lose sight of what's important. Um, young men should be taught similar things. We all have the same basic doctrine in the church that needs to be taught, but the emphasis for young men needs to be very, very pointed, just like it was for young women. Uh, young women are supposed to learn how to love their husbands. Uh, notice that it doesn't say anything about teaching young men to love their wives. It just says teach young men to be sensible. And if you are a wife out there, you probably wish someone had taught your husband to be sensible when he was a young man. Young men should be taught similar things with a different emphasis. And uh, there's a different translation that I thought was really, really good. The Living Bible translates it like this. Urge young men to behave carefully, taking life seriously. Um, man, I wish I could talk to y'all and just show you. Uh, I wish I had video examples of how much young men, I'm talking about high school age and college age students, um, don't take things seriously. And it's become more and more of a problem, especially, you know, during the day uh, for a long time I taught career technical education and a lot of times these young men just would not take what I was teaching serious wasn't just me, it was every teacher in their high school. Um, fortunately, we have so much access to technology and so much access to hands-on, and these kids can get so many skills in high school now, but I would, I would honestly say the biggest problem that I have had in dealing and teaching young men is that they don't take things seriously. Everything is a joke, everything is a game, and um, not that jokes and games aren't fun, but when you're a young man, growing up, um, that can be a very severe distraction and a very dangerous distraction because what it causes, and I've seen it more times than I can tell you, is that it just ends up in wasted years of their life where they had opportunities but were just goofing off. And I really do feel like growing, uh, helping a young man to grow is to teach him to be sensible, to teach him to be um, thinking carefully, behaving carefully. There's so many traps that a young man can fall into, just so many things that they can get wrapped up in. And when they're young and they don't think about everything, and everything's kind of a joke, it just makes it so easy for them um, to, to fall into a trap. It's basically like, have you ever seen someone who's walking and texting at the same time? Uh, I myself have walked and text and ran into poles, so I try not to walk and text very often. I now just stand still. But I've seen a lot of people, I've seen people fall into fountains, I've seen people trip, I've seen people really hurt themselves because they're walking and texting. And when you're, you're doing two things at once, you can't pay attention. And that's what's happening with young men. And the church needs to be instrumental. Paul is telling Titus, the church has to be instrumental to urge young men to be sensible, to be careful, to take life more serious than they were. In verse 7, we see... Um, Paul kind of turns his attention to Titus. He kind of breaks from what he's teaching. Uh, older men, older women, younger women, younger men. And then he has this break and he talks directly to Titus. And he says, um, I'm going to try to put this on the screen while I talk to you guys about it. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, um, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. So he makes this point to, uh, to Titus here, and he says, Titus, you, you have to be the example. Um, to 
all of these age groups to older men, older women, younger women, and younger men. That's hard to do when you're a Titus who is probably a younger man. Um, but Paul says to him, you have to set that example. And part of being that example means you have to be above reproach, which it mentions here uh, in verse 8, that you need to be above reproach. He says to Titus, he says, demonstrate a pattern of good works. Show doctrinal integrity. Um, be careful with your words. And that's, when you're in leadership, that's very, very, very important because people look at you and judge you. I know the Bible says, judge not lest ye be judged, but man, people judge. People judge harshly. You can have just an old, rotten sinner that's living their life however they want to live it, and if the pastor messes up and does one little thing, or the elder messes up and does one little thing, maybe he's having a bad day and he says something in anger he shouldn't have had, shouldn't have said, even the most sinful of people will jump to condemn. And so Paul says to Titus, you've got to live that example each and every day. So he gives this discussion about teaching, and then he turns his attention to Paul, I mean to Titus, and Paul says to him, you've got to make sure that you're doing good works. Um, not just teaching about them, which pastors sometimes get so wrapped up in the teaching and the preaching that they forget to go do also. He says to be show doctrinal integrity. That's tough. Um, it's really easy to sit in a seminary class or a theology class or a Sunday school class and talk about what's right and what's wrong, what the Word of God says, and then um, have to end up in a place like Crete where people are just terrible and try to live out that doctrine. But Paul says to him, show good works, show doctrinal integrity. Don't, don't twist it to get your point across. Don't change things to try to, don't emphasize things that shouldn't be emphasized. Don't use the word of God in a way that's manipulative. Show doctrinal integrity. Be careful with your words. Oh, if you've ever been frustrated, you've, you know how hard it is to be careful with your words sometimes. That's, that's something we all have to be careful with, and pastors and elders even more so. Um, especially when you're trying to teach. As a teacher, you really do have to be very, very careful with your words. And in verse 8, he goes on and he says something about um, you need to be above reproach so that the people that are going to come against you will be put to shame. And you would think no one's going to come against Titus. I mean, Paul sent Titus. Paul sent him to be the, the fixer-upper of the church. But let me tell you, when people come into an organization or come into a church or come into a situation and try to fix, um, they're often, often attacked. That's that's very, very regular, and it makes it really hard. Anybody that challenges the status quo, even if it's right, even if it's the correct thing, even if they were sent by God themselves to God himself to, uh, to fix things, people are going to come against you. They're just going to. And Paul says there's a simple solution to this. Live above approach, and that way when the person... Who is, and let's be honest, when when someone shows up and begins to challenge things within the church and says, you know, we're doing this a little, we're doing this wrong, we're doing that wrong, you guys are living a sinful life, um, our, our response isn't out of thought. It's almost always out of heart. It's an emotional response. And Paul knows this, and he knows that the people in Crete, when Titus shows up and says, hey, you guys got to quit doing the stuff you're doing, you're terrible people. Uh, Paul outlined all the ways that they were terrible. And when Titus shows up and says, none of the ways that you're living are in line with the gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul knows that that's going to hurt them and that they're going to respond from their emotion. But, you know, the thing is, is that when people respond out of emotion, Paul says to live this blameless life above reproach so that when it comes time to actually, you know, they're angry and they're saying mean things about him, but when it comes time to cite examples when it comes time to really, you know, give your testimony about how terrible Titus was and they have to think about it, there's nothing that they can think of to condemn him. Yes, they're mad because of the things Titus said, but that boils out of their heart. But when they have to think about how Titus is awful, you know, really they can't think of anything. You know, and, and I've, I've, I have been like that. I've thought, man, that person's just terrible. And... You know, so other, lots of times people will just go along with you and be like, yeah, mm -hmm, they're awful. But sometimes people will challenge you and say, well, what have they done? And, you know, I'm like, well, you know, they're just, they, um, hmm, well, you know, maybe they're not that bad after all. It, when it comes from our emotions, we have just this tendency to be so irrational. But Paul says, just don't give anything to them. Don't give them any fuel for their fire. 
and that fire will go out. And that's great advice for all of us as believers because you may have to confront someone in your family with an addiction, with a sin, with a problem, and they're going to react negatively towards you. They're going to be mad at you. But when it comes time to actually think about why, what you've done, they're not going to have anything to blame you for. They're not going to be able to say, you know, they're a really great person. I don't know why I'm so upset. When we have to actually think, it, it causes us to calm our emotions down. And that's what Paul is saying. He said they'll be put to shame when they try to come up with something against you because they'll, they'll have gotten so passionate and so riled up. But then when they're called to account on what made you so bad, they won't have anything to say about you. And that's great advice from Paul, especially um, you know, in the world of church politics. We know how sometimes church politics can get a little bit crazy. Um, but definitely live your life blamelessly. Um, the next verse going on, Paul shifts gears again. He's back to establishing a teaching idea. And he says here, um, urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. Um, teaching servants is the next thing. And this doesn't translate terribly well um, for our culture. We don't have slaves anymore. Um, the aspect in which a lot of people had servants or slaves back then, um, different Bibles translate it differently because the word slave has such so much... Um, baggage attached to it. So some translate it bond servants. Um, a lot of these people were in debt and they sold themselves into slavery. They Someone would pay off their debt and they had to go work for them for usually a term, not indefinitely, not forever. Um, for the most part, there was a lot more freedom to come and go. Um, it was kind of like you had a a, a day job or sometimes a day and night job. You, you lived on premise and you worked a lot. But um, it, it was a slightly different circumstance than we think about slavery as it was associated with the early American experience um, of slavery. It's slightly different. It was more of a, a form of welfare to get people who were in debt out of debt and to get them back into work and to get them kind of on their feet. Um, there, were sla there was instances of slavery in, in that time period that looked more like the American form of slavery like most of us think about from our history books, but it wasn't always that way. And Paul says to these people um, that they're supposed to be subject to their own masters. Um, and it, a really interesting thing about the early church is that the early church did not recognize slaves and masters. They, they thought of them as different people, um, individuals not necessarily honoring that relationship. And their roles weren't even honored within the church. There were instances of people who were bond servants or slaves becoming elders in the church and then their masters being members of the same church. So when they walked into church, um, the, the bond servant or slave would have spiritual authority over the master. And then when they walked out, they had to do what Paul says. Um, Paul says to these bond servants, obey, do what they ask you to do. Don't, don't be difficult about it. Paul, Paul's not supporting the practice of slavery, but he's teaching how slaves, bond servants, whatever you want to call them, um, how they are to live a Christ-like life even in that situation. They're to be subject and obedient to the commands given. They're to do their best to make their masters happy. Um, they're to be respectful, not argumentative. And they're not supposed to skim or steal from their masters. It was crazy because during that time period, it was just kind of an expectation that all servants were going to steal. It was like, well, it was just something that was expected, like it was culturally expected. Something that you just said, well, that's going to happen no matter what. I know the servants. I know not to leave those things out because they'll take from me. But Paul says, don't even do that. Paul says to the servants, you be above reproach also. You live a life that, um, according to Paul, what he says here is um, showing all good faith so that they will adorn the doctrine of, of God our Savior in every respect. Paul says be the best, hardest working, most obedient, most respectful, most honest, honorable servant you can be so that when your masters look at you, they think this Jesus Christ is an amazing, has had an amazing effect on this man or this woman. Let's be honest about how the world um, 
how the world looks at Christians, they look at us really, really harshly, and they judge us very, very harshly. Um, the you could live almost a perfect life, and the least little thing, the world is going to judge you so cruelly for that, and that's what they do. And um, Paul says, don't give them that opportunity if you're a bond servant. Bond servants, slaves, they have every reason to complain, every reason to grump, every reason to be difficult sometimes, but. Paul says, don't do that. Don't, don't be that way. Honor God each and every day in your service. And your masters and the people around you will learn to respect and honor God also. And it's all about living that example. And Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't hold back from any group of people within the church at Crete. He hits the older men and women. He hits younger men and women. Um, he even talks to slaves. He's trying to get Timothy on the right page. And going on in verse 11, it says this. Um, verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing the salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Paul says here, um, don't trample on the grace you've been given. Don't trample on the grace that's been given you. A lot of people use the grace of God as a get out of jail free card. They gotta keep, a lot of people get saved and they just keep living their lives how they want to live it. They don't honor the grace that has been given us. Um, and he says to, he says to Timothy, he says to Titus, excuse me, here that um, that the purpose of Christ's sacrifice was to purify us um, through his deeds and his teachings. Jesus did that to purify us so that he could have us for himself. Jesus didn't come not only Jesus came not only to save us, but he also came to redeem us as a people for himself. He's a king establishing his kingdom. And Paul's trying to remind Titus of that aspect that it's not just living your life good for the sake of good but it's the fact that Jesus Christ sacrificed so much and forgave so much we're so indebted and that grace um, has such a heavy weight that it should change how we live and how we think about things you've been forgiven so much you have no right to not forgive You've been forgiven so much, you have no right not to honor other people that are that you're working for. You have been given, forgiven so much through grace that, and loved so much through grace that you have no right to do the things you used to do. That grace should have changed you, and you shouldn't muddy up the name and the gospel of Jesus Christ by ignoring the grace that's been given you. And that's what they were doing in the church at Crete. It was an awful place to be. Um, he says, instructing us to deny ungodliness, ungodliness in worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And he's saying here to the people um, to stop living the way that they were living and to start living the way that they were supposed to be living. Because if you think about going back to how things happened in Crete, um, the beginning of the chapter 1, Paul just like lives a, he gives a whole list of how awful these people were. The very last verse we're going to look at in chapter 2, last verse of chapter 2, is verse 15. And it says this, um, Paul tells Titus to preach, teach, and discipline the church with all authority and not to allow anyone to be dismissive of him. Um, These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And the reason why is because, you know, it's real easy to discredit someone and then no one has to listen to them. But if you keep talking and you keep pushing, people will listen. And Timothy was in a really, excuse me, Timothy, Titus. Titus and Timothy are so close in my head, always get them confused. Um, Titus was in a tough spot. He was showing up. He was a younger guy. These house churches were already established. Things were already going. Um, They already had elders and pastors and people leading the churches. Of course, they were leading the churches the wrong way. And pretty much what Paul's instructing Titus to do is show up and kick down some doors and shake things up within the church. Titus was going to have to get rid of some elders and some pastors and some people in leadership um, if they didn't change their ways. Titus was supposed to show up and go from church to church, present this information that Paul's giving him, 
and try to get them back on track. Pretty, pretty tough task for Titus. Um, but Paul starts off, one of the very first things he talks about is teaching. And I want to talk to you guys about that. Um, I asked you at the very beginning, what's the difference between preaching and teaching? What are the difference between the two things? Um, preaching is important to win people to the gospel and convict people of sin. But teaching is foundational in growing and establishing the church. Things went wrong in Crete because people were being saved by preaching and evangelism, but no one was being taught how to be a Christian. Think about the sermons where you, you know people are getting saved. It's usually a very a very heavy emotional sermon that draws on aspects of sin and failure and then the redemption of, and sacrifice in Jesus Christ. And you walk down the aisle burdened and called by the Holy Spirit, and you walk down the aisle and you're just broken because of those things, and you get saved, and then you know you get baptized, and all of a sudden, bam, you're a member of the church. And that's where a lot of people get left off. That's where a lot of people... A lot of people stop and that's where a lot of them continue to grow it's like you know you get the seed out of the packet you put it in the dry ground that's it hope it grows on its own if you're wanting to produce a crop you've got to you've got to get the soil ready you've got to water it you've got to weed it you got to you know fertilize it cultivate it make sure that it's growing sometimes prune it um, but that's not really what happens because We've kind of forgotten that there should be a difference between preaching and teaching. And a lot of emphasis isn't on teaching in the church as much as it used to be. Um, I, I would, I've heard this so many times in different churches. Um, people say things like, um, let's have a revival. Well, I don't really know if you can have a revival. I think that kind of has to be something that the Holy Spirit inspires. Um, but we have these meetings, and I, guys, I, I tell you, I have... I'm just going to be honest with you, I've kind of gotten sick of revivals because at every revival I've ever been to in my entire life, I've seen people come down the aisle moved and emotional and weeping and crying. They, they, they get saved. Sometimes they get saved again. And then they um, maybe come to church for a month and then they disappear. And I've seen it a lot. I mean, a lot. I've, I've, been involved in churches, I've been going regularly to church, you know, for um, 25 years, and I, I've seen this happen over and over. It's very rare that people get saved and then stick and, and hang around and don't go somewhere. And really the truth is, is because we've gotten so far away from making sure that we're teaching as much as we're preaching. In fact, honestly, I think you need to teach more um, preaching is just it's, it, preaching is opening the door, but teaching is is foundational to growing the individual. Um, and, you know, in America, we've had this issue for a while because as America grew, people immigrated here and spread out. We didn't have established churches for a long time. Before the Second Great Awakening, a lot of churches were very well established, and there were teaching programs in the churches. Um, Churches in the 16, 17, 1800s, as they grew, had very, very strong teaching programs. But in America, what we see happening is this spread across the United States, and we had circuit riders, and we had a lot of revivals, and, and people were getting saved, and um, they would take it on themselves. The church really wasn't functioning well enough in a lot of places to have a teaching ministry, to have a teaching emphasis. And so what you end up with were people that were having to learn on their own, which was okay. Um, back then people spent more time reading before the internet um but now fast forward to the year 2020 and what we have are people that are getting saved and that's the end of it they're not really learning how to live their life i can remember getting saved at a, at a very young age and i went to church off and on as i went i often didn't learn anything at all. Um, I didn't learn anything at all. I was often like very, very confused about what they were talking about. I didn't understand. Even in Sunday school, we were still just coloring pictures of Noah. So it became kind of a big deal. Um, 
And it's this reason, you know, what we have right now is a group of really shallow believers who don't get it, who don't understand, who are struggling in every way, shape, and form to be um, Christians. This is why Paul says to the people in Crete, uh, to Titus, to the people in Crete, you've got to teach them. Because the exact same thing happened in Crete. All of a sudden, these evangelists rode into Crete, they showed up, they, they got people saved, they preached, and then they left. And they left the people in Crete to kind of build the church the way they wanted. And they built the church in their own image. They built the church from their own culture. And that's what's happened so many times. And that's what's happening in America a lot today is we're building a church in our own, our own image, in our own culture, rather than trying to learn what the Bible actually says. Um, and this is a problem we face a lot today. A lot of people have become believers and they're really struggling. And what we need to do is for our church just think about how we need to build a strong teaching ministry within the church the problem is building a strong teaching ministry is such a slow slow process that teaching ministry and keep it going sometimes it may take as much as a decade to make it happen um, but the good thing is is once you get a teaching ministry established a lot of times it self-perpetuates for years and years and years and just keeps going and growing and being fantastic. Um, it's hard to do, but once you get it going, it kind of serves itself. Um, churches have to change. Churches have to change what they value to get a teaching ministry up and going. And there's a lot of reasons why churches don't have it because it's so much hard work. But when you value seeing people grow in the church rather than just seeing people come to the church. That's revolutionary, and that's what changes lives forever. When you see people come to the church to grow, um, it really, really changes the entire culture and the mood and the entire everything. It allows God so much more opportunity to work as people become more and more mature as believers rather than just remaining those surface believers. Well, that's all we have for today from the book of Titus chapter 2. Um, join us next week. We're going to keep going in Titus chapter 3. Um, we're going to have a uh, church on Sunday, so don't miss that. We're looking forward to seeing you all there, and I hope you guys have a really great day, really great uh, Thursday and the rest of the week, and uh, we're going to have a word of prayer, and we'll sign off. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, and thank you for giving us these things to think about as far as teaching is concerned. God, I pray that you would help us to strengthen our teaching ministry in our church and that we would be more mindful about teaching one another and helping one another to grow, God. Father, we just thank you for the examples you've given us in Jesus Christ and through Paul and Titus, God. And we just pray that we would take his words to heart and meditate on these things this week. Lord, I just pray for my friends and family out there watching this on Facebook. And God, I look forward to seeing them all again this weekend when we come together to worship. Pray you keep them safe and be with those who are struggling and hurting and have recently lost loved ones. All these things we lift up to you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Bye, guys. Have a great day.